Th thank you so much for that introduction. And now, I, now I'm, 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 I'm worried that I have to say something. So uh, that, uh, that's, uh, it's a tall order. Um, so I want to begin by, by just saying something general about the state of discussion of homelessness. Um, so uh, it's, I, I think most of us will, uh, will assume uh, or presume that homelessness is, is wrong, bad, or unjust. Um, and a lot of the theorizing that goes on about homelessness, when there is theorizing that goes on, there's not a ton of it, um, uh, pr uh, presumes that we already understand what the wrong or what the badness of homelessness consists in. So the thought is something like, yeah, we know uh, why it's bad. Uh, housing is good, being sheltered is good, um, and uh, those who don't have uh, access to housing are in a bad state. And so the question really isn't about you know, what's wrong with it or what's bad about it, but the question is what to do about it. So we very quickly move to talking about policy solutions or just applying uh, theories that we've developed in the context of you know, some other conversation um, and, uh, and assume that that's good enough when talking about homelessness. So you could give a utilitarian account and many economists will do something like this and say, well, what we need to think about is whether or not resources are being used in um, the, the proper way so as to maximize utility. Um, in the, uh, when we look at people who are living on the streets, we see that resources could be spent better to serve that, that population, um, and so we should go ahead and, and do that. Um, there, uh, there are some accounts that, um, that you know, I'll call distributive accounts that think of housing as just like a resource, just like any other resource. Um, it's a resource that's um, you know particularly valuable, and so we need to ask questions about how to distribute the housing that we have, or something like that. Um, and again, I mean, you can be a sort of Rawlsian about things, and. Um, you know, and, and just apply that kind of framework and say, okay, well, like, are, um, are we distributing housing in such a way that meets the principles that Rawls lays out, something like that. Um, I wanna do something a little bit uh, different or take a step back and ask some questions about what the wrong of homelessness consists in rather than sort of assuming it. And so I'm not gonna jump immediately to, and, and really I'm not gonna talk all that much at all about solutions to homelessness and rather I'm going to try and think through um, what, it, uh, what it means to be homeless and what the injustice of it might consist in. And I think those, the answer to those sorts of questions should frame our discussion about what we should do about homelessness, okay? Um, my, my suggestion, just to preview it, is that homelessness amounts to a kind of exclusion from society wherein a person is denied social recognition that's, uh, that's necessary for societal membership. Um, and uh, I, I think it'll become clearer what I mean by that as, uh, as we move along. Um, one, uh, one comment about methodology here, I think philosophers very quickly jump to talking about things at a high level of theory uh, under many circumstances. But what I'm, what I'm gonna do here is say some things uh, about um, you know, very, very specific circumstances and tell you some very specific stories that I draw upon, I'm, I'm gonna draw upon um, memoirs and ethnographical work and, um, and in one case some personal experience um, to, uh, to give you a kind of picture that I'll, that I'll then try to theorize a bit. So there's gonna be a fair amount of just like storytelling at the beginning of this. So um, this is section two on the handout now. I'm gonna tell you about five, five different sorts of stories that, um, that, uh, in, uh, that each of which is going to um, point out or highlight an aspect of homelessness. And then I, I hope that um, all of them together, through, all, through telling all of these stories together, a kind of picture will emerge. So the first is gonna to have to do with relationships. Um, and, the, and the first story is Elsie, um, who, um, 
uh, who is somebody, someone who lived, I believe, in Pennsylvania. And uh, Elsie, like a lot of people who end up finding themselves um, w without housing, was um, uh, you know was was in a mar uh, in a um, you know, a destructive and toxic marriage and sought a divorce and um, and so fled her home um, and moved to Washington D.C. without many resources. When she got there, she found a roommate for a while, but then that roommate eventually um, found a partner and wanted her to move out. Uh, she didn't have a place to go after that, and after a short period of time, ended up. Um, uh, uh, living, uh, living in a shelter. She moved uh, in and out of various shelters for a while. Um, and then uh, at, at one point, um, she remembered that she had a contact from a couple years earlier, uh, um, a person who she considered a friend, uh, who had been selling makeup. Um, and she thought it would be a good idea to call that friend um, and, uh, and, and sort of like make that contact again. Uh, she actually wanted the friend to come and uh, and show some of the makeup uh, at at the homeless shelter to um, to uh, the clients that were living there, uh, and uh, and and you know the presumption was that maybe she would uh, be able to sell some makeup as well, right? Um, so she reached out to this person who she thought was her friend, and her friend said, "Geez, you're you're." you're homeless again now, you've been moving in and out of this, you really need to get your life together. Um, and you can see that all of, the, uh, all of the decisions that you make and the way that you run your life has led to this. Uh, you are lazy and you're fat. Um, that's, that's what this person who she really thought was her friend had to say to her. So, the, I mean, this is an anecdote, right? But uh, we know from uh, we we know from the research that uh, that people who find themselves in the circumstance of homelessness um, often uh, have uh, strained relationships with the people who they had counted on throughout their lives. Um, they are often abandoned by their family members and by their friends. Those who you sort of count upon to uh, to help help you out, uh, um, make contacts in the business world, um, help you find a job. Um, those people often just abandon you altogether. Um, this this happens um, uh, this happens with cases like Elsie, where the where the the person is you know obviously b behaving terribly, but in many cases too, family members just don't know what to do with a person who has found themselves in this circumstance. Um, it's often the case that um, those families don't have the resources to help the person, and so they feel very embarrassed. Um, it's often the case that um, um, that the People who find themselves uh, homeless have um, uh, have uh, um, mental um, you know mental disorders and struggles that um, make them difficult to deal with or make the family find them difficult to deal with, and so it's often the case that these relationships that we count upon to sort of like you know structure our lives and prop us up when we're having trouble you know just evaporate when you become homeless. Okay, so um, secondly, uh, there's the issue of employment. So here's the story of Ron. Uh, Ron uh, moved to Austin, Texas because he didn't have a job and he heard that he would be able to find, um, uh, he would be able to find something there. He heard that this was a, a good welcoming place for those who are transient. Um, uh, once he arrived, uh, he found it more difficult to find a job than he ex expected. And, um, and soon he was living out on the street. So uh, he, uh, I believe, was living on the top of a building for a while. Um, and so he, he did not have a stable residence and also didn't have a phone. Um, but he was a applying for jobs. But what he knew you know, and what was obvious to him was that uh, any, uh, any potential employer or many potential employers um, if, if they knew that he was homeless, we're not going to hire him. They consider people who were homeless to be um, a problem. They're less likely to show up to work. They are, um, uh, and so they are discriminated against. Um, 
Also, this is perfectly legal, by the way. Like, I, I am not under, you know, under the law, I'm not allowed to discriminate against you on the basis of your race or your gender. I am allowed to discriminate against you uh, on the basis of your living situation. I am allowed to not hire you because you are homeless. Um, at least in most states. Uh, I don't know of any where there, where there is a, a law against this. So Ron applies to uh, an Arby's and is told that um, uh, it is told that he's going to be hired. Um, but then when he comes back, they say it turns out that we don't need you after all. And uh, as he described it, they were they said we actually thought about it and we were hoping for somebody with more Arby's experience. All right. Uh, and so what uh, what he concluded from this was that they took a look at his application and determined that he was uh, very likely to be transient. Um, and uh, and they uh, because he didn't put down a phone number because he didn't have one, um, and they figured all right well uh, you know the, this might end up being more trouble than it's worth and so uh, we'll we'll just wait and find someone else. Again, very very common experience. Um, um, uh, a large portion of the homeless population is employed. Um, but they are much less likely to retain the job that, that they are in, and it often takes a much longer time to find a job than you would expect given somebody's resume. Um, so, uh, um, so once again, um, the employment situation is, um, is quite dire for those who uh, are unhoused. Okay, so the third has to do with bureaucracy. So, um, Chanel uh, lived in New York City. Uh, this story comes from uh, Andrea Elliott's um, um, Invisible Child, which is a book that came out in, in 2021. It was a New York Times bestseller, I think, and it's really wonderful, and I recommend it. Um, so Chanel, uh, um, in, in order to get housing in New York City, had to undergo a, an eligibility review. Um, at the uh, at the housing authority. Now, uh, Chanel lived, I believe, in Lower Manhattan, and the housing authority was in uh, in the Bronx, and so she had to go all the way there. Um, when she arrives, um, it's uh, she has to spend a large portion of the day standing in line and waiting to be uh, uh, consulted with and and talked to. And what she finds out is that in order to become uh, eligible for housing in New York City, she needs to turn in all of this paperwork. Um, the paperwork is just sort of all over the place. It's kind of wild, like what it's required. So you know, she needs birth certificate and um, and you know, past uh, record of past employment, record of of, uh, of past residences. Um, and so all of this, all of this is like extremely, extremely difficult to gather for somebody in this circumstance. It's difficult for me to gather this stuff, right? Um, you know, if you think, I, if you think right now, um, in, in order for you to find housing, you need to gather up, you know, a whole bunch of information and records that show like, you know, what's been going on in your past for, for you, you're like, you know where your birth certificate is right now? I bet many of you don't, right? So, uh, so there, there's that, but secondly, she also has to prove that she doesn't have uh, the opportunity to be housed somewhere uh, um, that, uh, with a, a friend or relative or, so, or somebody who could put her up, right? So it, the responsibility is on her to prove that, uh, that uh, she, uh, she can't find housing somewhere else. How would you go about proving that exactly? That's a very hard thing to prove. And also, it requires doing some of the things, like if you're thinking about how to gather proof, um, it requires doing things like showing that people in your life have abandoned you. So think about how uh, you know, humiliating that would be, right? So if you think about uh, Elsie and her friend, um, uh, it, it's, uh, like I said, many, uh, um, many people who are homeless have this experience of being abandoned, and now in order to find housing, you have to prove that you've been abandoned to some bureaucracy, right? Um, so again, very, very common experience. Um, finally, or no, not finally, but two more, um, this has to do with the police. 
So uh, this one comes from uh, one of my favorite books on this topic. Um, it's called Down, Out, and Under Arrest by Forrest Stewart. If you're going to read one thing on homelessness and policing, um, this, this would be the thing to read. So um, uh, James worked out, um, he, he and a bunch of friends had, had uh, created a, a kind of um, outdoor gym in Skid Row in Los Angeles. Um, where, where they would lift weights. So many of them had had drug problems in the past and, um, you know, and so were looking for a, uh, a way to spend their time where they would be you know, doing something healthy and uh, supporting one another in doing something healthy, right? Um, and so, uh, th you know, this became a positive thing. There was, um, in the park, there was this, this uh, w weight yard where they, where they were lifting. And then one day uh, the police arrived and they came in and they said, look, you're making this place look like a prison yard um, and, uh, um, and it's making people feel safe and uncomfortable. Why exactly? I don't, I don't know. Um, but they said, you know, you, you can't do this anymore. You can't congregate like this. Um, and so this positive thing that they were doing and this community that they had built around this, you know, evaporated. The ethnographer who tells this story, Forrest Stewart, um, said that he ran into James, who had run the, the weight stack, um, you know, several months later, and you know he, uh, you know, fallen back on harder times and was back on drugs. And he said, "Look, the the small, the very small positive thing that I tried to do, um, you know, was just taken away from me. And then I'm left in this circumstance where I'm like, you know, why, why even try? But that's the way that he described it. So." Um, it seems uh, often that the police uh, and their and their relationship to those who are unhoused, you know, is is one in which they are um, um, how to put this exactly. They uh, they they work on. They're often working on behalf of those who are housed to make them comfortable, right? Uh, and in the meantime, uh, they destroy the um, they, they destroy the you know com communities and positive things that the homeless populations are doing, right? And this is you know this is very very common. So if you look at tent cities in Lo Los Angeles now and San Francisco, um, it's just often the case that uh, the police arrive unannounced or with little notice and just and just break break the tent cities down um, and so everybody has to go somewhere else and if you had a neighbor before that you got to know or something like that they uh, they have to go somewhere else too and you might not see them again so um, so finally um, to tell a story about uh, about community um, so I live in Portland Maine um, and uh, we have a, a substantial homeless population there and uh, there's a neighborhood called the Bayside neighborhood where um, in recent years, a lot of fairly wealthy people have moved. Um, and there's um, you know, there are a number of nice restaurants and things like that there. And uh, so um, it's about a year ago now, um, the, uh, the homeless shelter wanted to um, put in uh, another facility that would uh, provide beds for 40 uh, unhoused persons. Um, and so, you know, as most of you probably know, in order to put up anything and run something like this, you have to go through um, your, um, several bureaucracies and you have to get approval from the zoning board and ver various licensing boards, right? So. Um, so the the zoning the, the zoning board ha held a um, um, an open meeting about this, where members from the Bayside neighborhood uh, came and objected to it, and they said things like, "Well, you know, this is our neighborhood. Um, you're bringing these people here and um, and making them our problem." And look, I mean, so. Bayside neighborhood is also very liberal, right? And they think of themselves as 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 being, you know, progressive and high-minded about things. And so they're like, you know, like we we think that um, you know, that we should be providing for homeless people, but the burden of these people should be distributed. This is our our neighborhood, and so you should send them send them elsewhere. We have too many here already. Now, 
like the interesting thing about this, I was at this meeting, and the, the interesting thing about it is there, there were unhoused people at the meeting, right? Um, and, uh, and they're being told that they are not members of the community, right? Like the idea is this is, our, this is our community and they are a burden that needs to be distributed throughout the city, right? Um, but I did like, I, you know, I, I had this thought like, well, what, um, like what neighborhood is theirs or if, if the, the homeless persons, like if, if they're not members of the, the community or the neighborhood, um, uh, what community or neighborhood are they members of? Like why, why is it the case that they're being told that uh, they are the interlopers, right? Now, part of the, uh, part of the, um, uh, the interesting thing about this is like, you know, I, you know, I obviously, you know, found this morally troubling and very uncomfortable to see this happening. But I also like knew what the members of the Bayside community were talking about, right? Like I, um, uh, we in the United States and I myself often consider a, a neighborhood to be constituted by the people that own property there. Um, that's, that's how I tend to think about it because that's how I've been taught. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, neighborhood associations and things like that, they, they assume that as well. So I know what they're talking about, right? Um, and so do the people who are homeless. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's, there's just a sense there in which, like, you know, there's a discourse that makes total sense to everyone. You know, uh, this, is our, this is our neighborhood and, uh, and you don't belong here. Okay, so, so those are those are the little vignettes. Those are the the stories that I'm I'm beginning with, um, and so now now I'm uh, I want to draw upon them to to give what I what I think of as a an analysis of the wrong or the injustice of homelessness. So. I think that having the status, uh, having the status as a member of society, involves being recognized along various dimensions. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go deep into what I mean by recognized. There, are different people mean different things, and I'm, I'm hoping that the meaning of it can sort of emerge from the stories that I'm, I'm telling. But the, but the thought is something like. Uh, in order to be a member of a, of a community or society, you need to kind of like register in a particular way for other people, right? Like, um, you know, when, when you show up um, uh, at, you know, at the housing authority, um, you know, they're, they're going to respond to you and help you with your problems, right? Like when, when you show up at the community meeting, they're going to treat you like a member of the community, right? Um, so uh, in, in, order, uh, in order to be a, you know, a fully fledged member, um, you, you know, some of these things have to happen or all of them have to happen. Another way to put this or another way to think about it that I think is helpful is, well, think about what your membership in a particular community consists in. If you think like, no, I really belong. Um, it will involve the, uh, everything from, well, I, you know, I have relationships here. There are friends that look out for me and family members who, you know, I will help. Um, you know, uh, if I apply for a job, uh, you know, I'll be considered for the position if I'm qualified. Um, you know, if there's a bureaucracy and I go in and say, you need to help me with this thing, you, you'll be helped. Um, if you call, uh, if you call the police um, and, and say I'm having a problem with this, you know they, they will do something for you rather than uh, rather than act against you all of the time. Um, all of these things, you know, are part of what what it means to um, be part of a community in the first place. But these examples that I've given you sort of suggest that. Um, um, that, the, that what it means to be homeless uh, is to be excluded in a very deep sense from the community and the society in which you live. These things that you might consider to be constitutive of you being a fully fledged citizen, you know, are, are denied to you and denied to you in very stark and very noticeable and very salient ways. So, uh, the intersection and combination of these facts, like you know, the various things that I've just pointed to, 
work together to generate something that can look like all out exclusion, right? So it, you know, it's not just, it's not the case probably that you know, if all your relationships fall apart, then you're completely excluded from society. But just think of the intersection of that with all of the other things that I've talked about, where you, you go to the bureaucracy, to the, um, to the Arby's, uh, to your friends, to the police, to the community meeting, and you don't register anywhere. Um, all of this adds up to a picture in which you you don't belong and you don't draw upon the resources and um, and the support that society is there to offer. Um, I don't think that this is just an issue of distributive justice. You know, so the issue here isn't just that um, some people are not being given. Um, their fair share of the resources that society has. I think it's something much darker and, and much more harrowing, which is um, that, uh, and, it, and it's something that I think cuts to the, um, cuts deeply to the heart of our status as a liberal democracy. The, the idea that we are a liberal democracy is supposed to be one in which, which everyone belongs and nobody is excluded. Um, it's always been the case that we don't achieve that as an ideal, and you know, I don't think anybody thinks that we have. But my thought here and my suggestion is that with, uh, when we look at the homeless population, we have uh, a population that is excluded in an, ex uh, in an extreme sense in such a way that is, is inconsistent with our considering ourselves to be uh, a liberal democracy. Um, Okay, so that's that's kind of the, that's kind of the view that um, uh, I mean. Dan, Daniel began by saying that I'm I'm thinking about writing a uh, a book on this, or I'm working on something. That that's kind of like the key thought in the book is that we need to think about homelessness through this lens. So um, in in the time that I have left, I want to I want to um, add some complications and nuance here, and this is where um, you know I think um, there's there's something something to say that I think uh, will uh, re really help in thinking about um, uh, uh, the this situation that a wide range of people who are um, unhoused and uh, homeless adjacent uh, occupy. So, so here's a problem that that uh, you'll encounter if you read anything about homelessness at all. Um, we, it's very difficult to say of any particular person whether or not they are homeless, right? Because um, it's not it's not clear um, what the criteria are for being homeless. Now you might just think, well, that's it's easy enough. You just don't have a house that you live in, right? Well, you know, the, um, there are there are people who live under a bridge, right? Um, who have been there for years. Uh, that's you know. That's a paradigmatic case of homelessness. But what about somebody who's couch surfing, right? Somebody who has nowhere to go but um, but finds someone's couch to sleep on every night. Um, are they homeless? Um, uh, people debate about the, this sort of thing, right? And um, and people fight about whether um, and researchers and politicians fight about whether or not those people should count as homeless. Um, it's you know there's. Also, the question of um, you know how many homeless uh, persons are there um, in the, in a given region or in the United States over an entire year um, versus on a particular night because lots of uh, lots of people who are homeless are only homeless for a very short period of time, whereas others um, uh, a smaller number are homeless for a very long time, um, and so there's this. This giant mess about how to talk about um, homelessness and how to how to count people who are homeless, and it makes it difficult to say something general and at the normative level about um, the condition of homelessness because it's not clear that what you would say about the chronically homeless person applies to somebody who is couch surfing for um, a few months, right? Um, you know, and so if you want to give an analysis of the, of the wrong of this, you have a real problem here. Um, but, I, but I also think um, 
and uh, and I'm going to draw. Um, I'm going to sort of like put these two thoughts together. Um, I also think that you can't say of every person whether or not they are excluded from society, right? So I, I just ran through this list, you know, relationships, employment, bureaucracy, police, community. Um, and in each case, um, it seemed like, you know, there's some, there's some exclusion going on there, and it seems like it's pretty stark. Um, and if you are completely excluded in every way that I've described here, then obviously it seems like you're excluded. But very few people are in all of these circumstances all of the time, right? So it might be that uh, uh, you happen to be employed, um, but your relationships have fallen apart and you can't get the housing authority to respond to you at all, right? Are, are you excluded or not, right, um, uh, on, on my analysis? Um, it could be, uh, you know, it could, it could be that you're allowed at the community meeting, but people talk about you like uh, like you're not a member of the community. Are you excluded or not in, in that circumstance? Um, so uh, rather than rather than give a set of necessary and sufficient conditions where I say, well, this is what uh, exclusion consists in, I want to suggest that um, that uh, exclusion uh, and uh, and uh, homelessness both exist uh, on something of a spectrum, okay? And this is, this is on your handout. So I wanna suggest that, um, that on the, the far, uh, you know, on the, on the far right, um, you have those people who are housing secure, those are, those are people like me, right? I mean, th those, are, those are people who uh, own, their, own their own home, um, are not uh, financially at risk of getting uh, displaced from that home, have uh, money in the bank and a whole bunch of people who would help me out in case I needed to go somewhere, right? Um, it would actually take work for me to become homeless. It would be actually quite hard, right? Um, uh, there's, I mean, there, it's, age of this audience, but I, like, do you know MacGyver? You know MacGyver? I remember there was like a, I saw one hand like, I know MacGyver. Um, I mean, I remember there, um, as a kid, and there's this episode of MacGyver where uh, he goes undercover as a homeless person. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and at some point, uh, uh, they discover that he's not really homeless. So they're like, you know, you've, you've tricked us, MacGyver. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and he, he was like, uh, he, he turns to the homeless person and he says, hey, you, you and me, we are the same. The difference between you and me is just a little bit of luck. Well, I mean, it's just obviously bullshit. Uh, MacGyver is not going to be homeless. Uh, if, uh, you know, if, if MacGyver, uh, you know, had, um, yeah, were, fell upon hard times, you know, his various friends who arrive at various seasons of MacGyver would come to his aid. Um, but I mean, even at the time, like that sort of hit me, like you know, like well, wait a minute, like MacGyver's not going to be homeless. So, I mean, there's there's plenty of reason to think that, um, and it's it's also the case that many who work in homeless advocacy also say this thing, like well, anybody could become homeless. Um, I think it's actually quite wrong. I think on the on the right side of the um, uh, you know of the spectrum, it's very much a case that it's um, you know that you're very unlikely to become homeless. Um, a little bit to the left, we have those who are housing insecure. These, these are people who have a roof over their heads, um, but, it's, um, uh, but it, might, it might be the case that they've been evicted in the past and that they are behind on their rent and might be evicted again. Um, they might be worried that if they go to eviction court um, uh, and get that on their record, they won't be able to find a new, uh, a new place to rent. Um, and, uh, and in many cases, those who are housing insecure uh, end up at least temporar temporarily homeless. So a lot of the people who find themselves in shelters are people who have been recently evicted. Um, and so these, these people are not in the circumstance that I'm in, right? I mean, they, uh, they have some of the same problems and some of the same difficulties that those who have no roof over their head have. And they are uh, under constant uh, threat of finding themselves in that circumstance. Um, so further to the left on the spectrum, uh, you have those who are temporarily unhoused. Uh, now, the, this might be your couch surfer. 
um, you know, or um, you know, or somebody who is in a shelter for a short period of time. Um, they might fall in and out of homelessness for a while, but you know, this is a, a substantial category of, of people. And, um, and when you look at the numbers of, of homeless people, um, you know, I think the, the greatest proportion of them fall in, into this category. Um, uh, because, uh, because they're only temporarily unhoused, um, it's often the case that they, um, they don't uh, end up with excluded in all of the ways that homeless people often get excluded. And so they have certain advantages that might help them move to the right. You know, they might find, um, uh, you know, some uh, inexpensive housing to rent. Um, and then they'll probably be housing insecure. They'll probably be very worried about being evicted at some point. But, um, but they have resources to move that way to the right, possibly. But they're also in a circumstance um, where they might fall into what, we'll, what we call um, uh, cr the uh, chronically unhoused. Um, that is uh, the, uh, the population that I think we most commonly identify with homelessness. That is those people who live on the street or, um, or in a park um, or, or in a shelter for a long period of time. Oftentimes, um, oftentimes these people will, will be uh, unhoused for six months, a year, or several years at a time. Um, and this is also, uh, an, extre this is also a, an extremely difficult circumstance to get out of. So, you know, un unlike somebody who's like housing secure, becomes housing insecure, and then works their way back, um, somebody who is chronically unhoused, uh, who finds housing for a while, is very likely uh, to end up uh, um, unhoused again and back on the street. So the the interesting thing about this this spectrum um, is, I, I think you can think of it as um, as not just being a spectrum, but that there are kind of like two poles, you know, two magnetic uh, poles that uh, exert you know, some, some sort of force in each of the directions, right? So if you're, if you're on the far right, um, it's, it's actually tough to get out of the far right. It's, it's hard for people who are rich to become homeless. Um, and, if you, uh, and if they do move a little bit to the left for one reason or the other, there are lots of resources and, uh, and um, uh, attachments that they have within society that pull them back to the right. Um, the further that you get to the left, the more likely you are to be pulled all the way to the left. And, and it's extremely difficult to get out of um, the situation in which you are chronically unhoused. Um, and so I think that this is a useful and important way of thinking about um, how we should categorize people um, who are um, homeless or housing insecure and understanding their relationship to each other. But I, but I also think the spectrum represents a way of thinking about the extent to which people are excluded from society, right? So ex exclusion is not an either or thing. You're, you're either in or you're out. Um, uh, you, know, you can be excluded to various extents, right? Like, you know, if you have a family, you know, you, you, you might imagine that there are certain members, you know, maybe there are certain members you, you've kicked out of your family, but um, maybe there are some that, you know, you see them, but maybe they don't get the invitation to Thanksgiving dinner, right? Like, they're sort of excluded. Um, and so the, my, my thought here is that um, the further that you get um, to the left, the more excluded you are um, from society. And that also, that exclusion helps to understand why it's so hard to get out of the, the circumstance that you're in when you're on the far left of the spectrum. Similarly, on the far right end of the spectrum, the inclusion in society and the sort of um, bonds that you have with others and the way in which the police and bureaucracies work in your favor, these are the sorts of things that you know, help to make it the case that you're not likely to become homeless um, if, you're, if you're housing secure. So th that's sort of my thought that, um, that the way to think about the wrong of homelessness is to think about the ways in which 
those who fall on the spectrum are or are not likely to um, likely to be excluded, and uh, and why. Um, uh, and, and I think that I, I think that this, um, uh, and I think that uh, that also helps to explain the injustice of homelessness in a more interesting and robust way than simply saying, "Well, they've got less or fewer resources than they should have." Um, I want to I want to conclude with a um, uh, you know with a with a couple of thoughts. Um, the, the first is if I'm right about this, you know, you might ask, um, you know, who are who are the villains, you know, in the in this story? Like, who who are the bad guys? Um, and I think that, um, I, you know, I think that some of the way that I, I I told the story is a little vignette to the beginning, like you know, might make it seem like there are obvious villains, like the you know the person who, um, you know, the person who won't hire. Um, what was his name? Uh, Ron at the Arby's. Like you know, they seem like a villain in this story. Um, they seem like um, they're being exclusionary and bigoted and unhelpful and not a good, um, you know, not not a, not a good um, uh, citizen. However, like that that person, the, the Arby's manager, they also get something right. Like it's it's not ju it's. Uh, it is the case that those who are homeless are uh, less likely to show up for work, uh, likely more likely to abandon their job. Um, this this is for perfectly good reasons. You know, it can often be hard to uh, show up for work. You know, where you, when you don't know where you're sleeping or you don't have a uh, a, a residence that you can count upon. Um, you know, an Arby's manager doesn't make tons of money, right? Like they uh, they under a lot of stress, and they're they're just trying to fill a, a position. Um, you know, so uh, so you know, even even if we're inclined to think that that person didn't behave entirely admirably, I think that there's a, a way of thinking about this that makes it seem like no, like you know, this is an institutional and systemic problem, right? Like the the issue isn't. Well, like, well, you know, we should all be a little more uh, welcoming to those who are homeless. Like, we should, but um, but at the but at the same time, um, I think it's perfectly uh, I think it's per perfectly reasonable to say that um, that this uh, a society that allows homelessness of the sort that we do uh, makes victims of the people who then have to deal with the population that um, that is homeless. Similarly, at the community meeting, so again, to like point to people who I found, you know, like when I when I went to the Bayside meeting, um, you know, I found them like not the um, members of the neighborhood association, not very um, sympathetic. Um, but at, at the same time, I mean, they they do have this issue where there are, um, you know, there are people in their neighborhood defecating on their doorsteps and um, and things like that. It's not pleasant. And I don't live in the Bayside neighborhood and I don't have that problem. So it's easy for me to say that they should be happy about this. Right. Um, so I think um, I, I think one thing that this account shows is that um, that all of this is exclusion together creates a situation in which it makes sense or or at least it's um uh, you can understand why someone would uh, be exclusionary and so you know the uh the solution is probably not to you know have everybody change their heart or something like that but um but actually find ways of housing people um uh the second thought, and, and I'll end on this, um, is I think that there is an interesting intersection of the personal and the institutional here. Um, it's it's often pointed out that when uh, a homeless person is is sitting, uh, you know, on the sidewalk or on the side of the street, that um, most of the people that walk by don't look them in the eye or don't say hello to them, um, and uh, uh, and oftentimes. Um, uh, Homeless people will complain about this and say that they find this, um, you know, um, demoralizing, dehumanizing, uh, things like that, and that's that's all perfectly understandable. Um, it's uh, 
many have sort of like speculated about why it is that we don't look at homeless people when we when we walk by them. Um, some something something some people suggest that it's because we think that they're beneath us. Some think that it's because like we feel guilty when we have to look at the terrible situation that we put them in. But it, uh, you know, the, this is all, this is just speculative. You know, but I'll end on the provocative note. I think like one possibility is that. In a sense, um, when somebody looks away from uh, the homeless person on the street, they're getting something right, which is that the society really has refused to recognize them. They don't have the status of somebody that you look in the eye. They have the status of um, you know, something that needs to be um, removed or managed or dealt with. Um, they're not fellow citizens in the full sense. Um, you know, so, uh, and so if you grow up in a society that sort of like tells you at every moment that you know there's a you know, cer uh, certain portion of the population that you know really is just you know there to be dealt with and they're not members of your community then like of, of course you're not going to look them in the eye um, or at least you that's the sort of thing that you would expect now i'm not saying like go ahead and do that like well, you know, i'm not saying like don't look them in the eye right um i think you should look them in the eye and say hello but uh what but um at the level of tr like trying to understand this phenomenon i think like we we've trained people to do this we brought them up to not view homeless people as um those who we recognize and those who we look in the eye and so uh this is only what we this is just what we should expect so anyway, that, um, those are my th those are my thoughts. I'm looking forward to talking to you about, um, uh, about any questions that you have about it. Thank you all very much.